well, this was a fun paper to discuss because I think it's relevant to what's going on right now. I think it uses new, interesting data, and I think it has a lot to tell us about how macroeconomic credit lines matter. Okay, so this paper has two parts. It's also really long, Whew, 99 pages, and it has 67 footnotes. But aside from being extremely long, it's got some really interesting facts. It's got some old facts regarding monetary policy shocks with new data, but the facts we kind of already knew. What it also has, though, are some interesting new stylized facts on the usage of credit lines after shocks. And then it fit, so it, but it doesn't stop there. It then has a nice model that helps us understand the facts. Okay, so they're using something called the Y14 data, and these data are a gold mine. I'm working on a, a completely different paper on a completely different topic using the same data, and they are, in fact, a gold mine. So where does this come from? It comes from the Dodd-Frank Act, and banks are required to disclose the financials of the firms to whom they lend. And so you've got financial statements from both private and public firms that are banks are required to report, and it's on a quarterly basis. So it's a lot messier than CompuStat, but it's basically CompuStat for private firms in the US. And so it's an utter gold mine, and it gives us a much broader sense of the use of financial instruments in the United States. The other thing that's really nice about these data, something that I'm not using, but that he is taking, um, great uh, advantage of are these separate data on used and unused parts of credit lines. We've had some papers on this, but these are usually from very small hand collected samples. And so now we have this very large sample of firms and we can get a much broader picture of what's going on. So the Y14 facts are interesting. So he's got both level and change facts. So I didn't know this, the used portion of credit lines is about, is just a little bit more than half of all credit extended by these banks. And the unused portion of credit lines is greater than the used portion of credit lines plus the total amount of term loans. And then something I think that's not surprising is that big firms use more credit lines. So if you wanted to take away something about the level facts, that's what I'd take away. What about the change facts? The first fact is not surprising, but if it weren't in the data, we would all think that the data were wrong, so it's worth mentioning. Firms use credit lines after cash flows fall. Then increases in credit after contractionary monetary shocks are, are all credit lines. So we've seen this fact in the data that's kind of weird, it credit increases after tightening, but it's credit lines. And so these are discretionary drawdowns by large firms. And then banks then contract loans to firms without credit lines. So this is an interest, so this is the part of the paper that I think is most interesting, is this sectoral transfer. The model's kind of gnarly. There's two kinds of firms, there's constrained and unconstrained. They're both kind of the same. They use factors to produce output, they finance the factors with profits and tax advantage debt, debts constrained by covenants, dividends can't go negative. In this class of models, there's debts, debt, um, firms can cons conserve debt capacity because in this model they face covenant constraints. Constrained firms are more likely to face binding constraints. Constrained firms can only take out loans at a time varying spread above the risk-free rate and unconstrained firms can use credit lines that charge a fixed spread above the risk-free rate. So the important difference between term loans and credit lines is this fixed spread versus a time varying spread. And then in response to a negative TFP shock, this is in the most, the, they have many versions of their model. This is in the most complete version. Unconstrained firms compensate by using credit lines Constrained firms don't use as much debt because spreads rise. Constrained firms have a higher marginal product of capital because they're constrained. They're sitting there on the, the curvier part of their production function 
and so investment falls. And so this is the sense in which this sectoral transfer can allow these TFP shocks to have a, a aggregate effects in a new way. And the buzzer just went off on my watch, so I will turn the seminar over to Dan. Thank you so much, Dan. Go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Tony. That's fantastic. I feel like uh, I could skip the intro, but let's do it anyway. Um, so this is joint work with um, uh, John Craner and Pascal Paul, who are here. They can handle the tough questions uh, uh, in the chat as we go and afterward. And uh, the usual disclaimer applies. Um, okay, so um, the, the motivation goes back to the credit channel, which is kind of one of our uh, most celebrated ideas in macro. Uh, and it's a mechanism through which adverse shocks to the economy can either raise credit spreads or tightening for, tighten firm borrowing limits. And because of credit frictions, firms depend on credit for investment. And so this deterioration of credit supply actually can re end up reducing investment and economic activity. Um, but as Tony mentioned, uh, surprisingly, when you look at a number of shocks, bank lending to firms, in fact, often rises after adverse shocks instead of contracting. And for a prime example, a recent example, we can look at the response of U.S. commercial bank credit following the outbreak of COVID-19. Uh, so here we've broken it down into uh, loans to firms, basically CNI loans, consumer loans, real estate. And you'll notice that of these three, the CNI loans spike upward after the outbreak and the other types are flat. So this is really a phenomenon going on in the bank firm lending space. Now, of course, there's a lot of things that are special about the COVID uh, outbreak episode. It's kind of an extreme event. But um, you know, as Tony mentioned, this is also a pattern that's observed after more run-of-the-mill shocks like monetary policy shocks. So here I'm gonna show you some local projections that plot the response to a monetary policy shock following the Roma Roma identification. Now, if we could use others, they would give you the same result. What you can see here is again, CNI lending to firms from banks uh, actually rises significantly um, and you know, con continually over, over the horizon, while loans to consumers and our real estate loans actually fall. Um, now this is, as Tony mentioned, kind of an older fact. It's a puzzling one maybe, but uh, we're gonna revisit this in a little more detail as, as we go on. So um, overall, the fact that credit rises following these shocks don't prove or disprove anything by themselves about the credit channel because I'm not showing you a counterfactual without credit frictions. But they do raise what we think are some important questions. So first, why is aggregate bank credit rising following these shocks? And in particular, how are firms doing it? How are they avoiding the contractionary forces due to spreads and, and tightening constraints predicted by theory? Second, uh, we see an aggregate increase, but how is this increase in credit allocated across firms in the economy? And what does it imply for investment and output, kind of the real economic uh, variables we care about? And finally, what effect does this credit surge have on the banking sector and its ability to intermediate funds? So we're gonna take a look at all of these under the broader umbrella of asking how the structure of bank firm lending influences aggregate and cross-sectional outcomes following an adverse shock. And the key focus of our paper is going to be on these credit line facilities. Now, a credit line facility, unlike a traditional term loan, gives firms access to a, a committed amount of credit at predetermined terms and pricing. And we're going to argue in this paper that these are so important that really they, you should think about a credit line channel, the title of the paper, in terms of how they influence the traditional credit channel. The approach that we'll take is to combine uh, detailed bank firm data that, that Tony's uh, briefly mentioned with a structural model. The data comes from the Y14 stress tests, uh, which is the near universe of loans uh, to firms from sufficiently large US banks. And we're gonna pair this with a structural model that we think is able to capture um, the, the key mechanisms of credit lines, as well as the realistic debt constraints that kind of make them work in a theoretical setting. The main message we'll have for today is that we think that credit lines are really essential to the transmission of shocks to firm credit. Um, and just to kind of resolve our, our the maybe puzzling responses we showed before, uh, you can already maybe start to intuit why credit lines are important. And in particular, because in bad times, uh, banks really aren't able to prevent firms from borrowing at pre-agreed spreads that are not rising. So this idea that spreads should be increasing or that firms should be becoming more constrained by their borrowing limits is a little bit off the table for credit lines. So what do we find? Um, first, I'm going to show you some descriptive evidence on credit lines. Um, they, first of all, even in the used credit space, 
they're kind of a, a, the make up the majority of credit. So they make up more than half of bank firm credit in use. But maybe shockingly, the committed but undrawn balances on credit lines are actually larger than all the used bank credit combined to firms combined. And these undrawn balances are not evenly distributed across the firm population. Instead, they're overwhelmingly concentrated among the largest, most profitable firms in the economy. So that's kind of the description stats on the level. Now we're going to use some empirics to take a look at the dynamics, the role of credit lines in transmission of, of shocks. And first, we're going to show you that credit lines, um, maybe as a sanity check, as Tony mentioned, uh, are kind of the key instrument that firms use to respond to their own shocks. They explain um, most variation in firm bank credit. And they also explain uh, basically all of the response of firm bank credit to cash flow changes. Then we're going to look uh, at the macro level and um, show you that actually these credit line draws also dominate the credit response, at least the bank credit response, uh, to the COVID-19 outbreak, as well as to identify monetary policy shocks that I showed you earlier. So we can kind of start to resolve that puzzle a little bit. And finally, draws on credit lines uh, in terms of credit supply to other firms actually seem to crowd out term lending following the COVID-19 outbreak which is an important spillover. In the last part of the paper, we'll turn to a structural model to look at the general equilibrium implica implications, showing that not only do credit lines seem to be a convenient instrument, but their structural um, uh, qualities actually have important implications for macro dynamics. And in particular, we're, uh, we're going to argue that credit lines appear essential to explaining the flow of credit toward unconstrained firms that I'll show you in bad times. If you had a traditional model with term loans, there's uh, some powerful economic forces that would typically give you the opposite result. Now that's a distributional outcome. In terms of aggregates, what we find is the flow from, uh, of credit from high to low marginal propensity to invest firms can actually worsen the decline in capital. So even though you might say, wow, this is great news, actually even in bad times, firms are able to access credit. What we're finding is that this distributional allocation of that credit across the firm distribution can actually make the disinvestment even worse than if that credit wasn't available uh, as credit lines. So let's just cover uh, where we fit in the literature very briefly. Uh, first, there's a huge body of work on the credit channel, which this only kind of scrapes the, the tip of the iceberg. Um, what we're going to do here is focus on the role of credit lines in particular as key to explaining um, a number of firm debt dynamics. So we think that credit lines uh, may make some important twists on the traditional channel that, that we need to consider. Next, there's, of course, a, another great body of work on how uh, what we'll call the macroeconomics of firm heterogeneity, how heterogeneity within the firm distribution actually affects the aggregate response to macro shocks. And here we're going to provide a novel source of credit flows between heterogeneous firm types that, that fits very well into this, that kind of framework. Finally, there's also an amazing and huge body of work on the corporate finance of credit lines. Uh, and here we're going to add two things. One is, like Tony said, we're going to bring some new data to the table that, uh, in contrast to past work, is going to maybe be a bit bigger and um, in scale to revisit some of the same questions. But also, we're going to think about this from a, a macroeconomic uh, framework that's going to let us think about and study the systemic implications of credit lines. So let's talk about the data first. Uh, we're going to be using data from the Y14, the stress test data, and this is going to cover all sufficiently large bank holding companies in the US. Um, the sample is not that long because, as mentioned, this, this really comes from the, the reforms following the financial crisis. Uh, so we're, but we do cover uh, from 2012 Q3 up to 2020 Q1. We actually now have some data from Q2 in. I'll show you that if I have time. Um, but while the data is not that long, it's quite broad. So if you're wondering how much we cover, we're going to cover loans to firms that are uh, on, in magnitude on the order of half of total bank CNI lending in the US. And just so you know, we're going to exclude financial and real estate firms from our analysis. Now, this is a highly detailed data set. Uh, and in particular, it has a number of key features that would not be typically available uh, in public data sets. So first of all, this is a loan level panel. So it's going to actually going to track what's going on quarterly uh, on the universe of loan facilities of size greater than a million dollars. So it's really a huge, huge um, sub, uh, sample of loans. And importantly, as Tony mentioned, it's also going to identify whether the credit is in the form of a term loan or credit line, as well as for credit lines, the amount of undrawn credit on the line. And unlike some other data sets, that amount of undrawn credit is also going to be updated quarterly as we go through our data. 
It also covers a very broad sample of firms. So in addition to the you know, over 2,000 public firms you'd expect to see from a data set like CompuSat, it's going to cover over 200,000 private firms and in, um, incorporate the income and balance sheet information of all of those borrowers, even the private ones, which would be pretty difficult to obtain otherwise. So now let's jump right in and show you some of the results. So this table is going to show you kind of averages over our sample. And I'm going to break down various types of credit into credit lines in this column, term loans in this column. So first is the fact that I mentioned before, uh, which is that um, among used credit uh, from these banks to firms, just over half of it is in the form of credit lines. So credit lines are already, you know, um, just in terms of used credit alone, uh, kind of a co-equal or even a slightly more important form of credit relative to term loans. But where credit lines really uh, are sort of shockingly important, at least I was shocked when I saw this, is in this pool of committed but unused credit. So used credit is uh, 940 billion. So I'm going to in interrupt. There's an interesting question. Isn't there a selection bias because all smaller banks aren't represented? Um, yes. So, so basically, we, yeah. we have to work with, with the banks that we have. Um, to some degree, uh, you might think that um, you might think that, that the smallest firms maybe are more likely to be linked to smaller banks. Um, it's not clear exactly how that would push our, our results. Uh, but if the small firms in general look more like the small firms in our sample, it would make the inequality, I think, seem even, even starker. Uh, beyond that, what I can say is I wish we had that data. Um, yeah. <laughs> we have to work with what we have. But also, the, there are lots of minuscule dinky firms in the Y14 data that would never show up. Yeah, lots of them. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. And so, so um, right, exactly. So, so first of all, it's not like we're not covering this, the smaller firms in the economy. There's lots and lots of very small firms. Thank you, Tony, for <laughs> answering the question better than I did. Um, and beyond that, um, uh, you know, to the extent you miss them, they tend to, to make up a very small fraction of things like employment and sales if, if you get small enough. So I think we're going to give you a pretty good picture of, of what really drives the macro aggregates that we might care about. Okay, so we're going to look now at um, the committed credit. So committed credit, amazingly, is more than twice as large as used credit. And in fact, the, the portion that's committed but not used is more than 40% larger than all of the used bank credit combined. And when you look at it that way, actually the role of credit lines is like really becomes the dominant instrument in the, the banking sector. So um, that's kind of at a static level. Here's just to show you what this unused capacity looks like over time. The blue line, uh, the blue area is used term loans. Green is used credit lines. And this light blue uh, is kind of an ocean of uh, unused but committed credit that banks, that firms could draw uh, from their banks. And you can actually see that this large unused capacity is very stable over time. Now, of course, in practice, right, this is kind of work that, that uh, Amir Sufi has shown. Uh, um, firms may not be able to draw 100% of this capacity because many of them would start to violate their loan covenants before using all of it, okay? So what we're gonna do to kind of try to ballpark this is take typical loan covenants that you would usually find on, on these firms and then ask how much of their credit line could they draw without violating the covenants? And that's really in some way their effective unused capacity. If you do this, which is the red line, what you find is that the, the remaining capacity between uh, you know, this, this portion of the light blue is still enormous. It's on the order of magnitude of all of used credit, basically. So even once you control for these mitigating factors, we still have a vast, vast capacity of undrawn credit here. So now let's go beyond the level and look at the distribution. The third fact that uh, we'll show is that unused credit capacity is overwhelmingly held by the largest firms, okay? So here we've plotted kind of uh, by percentile of the firm size distribution, the portion held by firms that size were smaller of kind of the following variables. These blue ones are used term loans and credit lines. Uh, green and purple are the unused credit and the purple is unused credit after controlling for that covenant measure that I described just now. And what you can see here is that of course, used credit is already unequal, but basically the top 10% of firms have somewhere between 40 and 50% of used credit. Unused credit is actually much, much more unequally distributed. So that actually, if you look at these lines, the top 10% of firms by size actually account for about 70% of unused credit. So this is actually even more 
skewed toward large firms than uh, use credit itself. So uh, where do uh, the large firms get all of this unused credit? Well, it's from a, a number of sources. So first, we can look at this panel, which just shows you how likely firms are to have a, diff a given type of credit in our sample. And you can see that actually um, uh, the x-axis is the percentile of the firm size distribution. And what you can see here is that actually um, as firms get larger, they become more and more likely to have a credit line facility. So that the, the smallest firms even you know, already have a 60% chance of having one. Um, but by the time you get to be a largest firm, it's getting pretty close to certain that you have a credit line. Second, uh, as firms get bigger, not only are they, are they more likely to have credit lines, but they're more likely to put more of their credit on credit lines. So this is the share of your total use credit in the form of a credit line. Um, and you can see it's, it's, in, it's increasing across this firm size distribution. Don't worry too much about this little uh, drop here. That's something about, uh, you can call it a mislabeling of the data. It's actually only localized to these very biggest firms. We think the very biggest firms actually still have the vast majority of their, their use credit in the form of credit lines. I'm happy to talk about this later if people have questions. And then finally, on top of their use credit uh, being more concentrated toward credit lines, large firms uh, also keep much, much more of their total credit unused. So here I've plotted the ratio of used to committed credit, meaning uh, the denominator is like the total amount pledged uh, by credit lines plus the total amount of term loans, which are the used and committed is the same. And what you can see here is that um, uh, the total amount of committed credit that firms have used is dropping uh, over the entire firm size distribution and is actually plummeting as you get close to the largest firms in the economy. And that remains true even after we control for uh, covenants. So basically um, you can see that the smaller firms are actually using most of their capacity, but the largest firms are using only a, a small fraction of their total, total committed capacity. Okay, so now let's ask, uh, go beyond the size distribution and ask what other covariates matter? What other characteristics matter? So we're gonna use a regression to try to ask uh, which characteristics of firms seem to drive credit line access and capacity. So specifically for firm I and industry K at time T, we're gonna estimate this regression, which is an outcome variable on uh, time and industry fixed effects, plus um, a vector of characteristics of interest, okay? Where our outcome variables are either gonna be a dummy for whether the firm has a credit line the unused borrowing capacity of the firm, meaning the ratio of unused to committed credit. And then the credit line intensity, which is, um, excuse me, um, the ratio of unused credit to the firm's total sources of liquidity, which would be their unused credit plus their cash. And so what you can see, uh, what I'll show you is our answer, which is that it's really the largest, most profitable firms in the economy who you would think have better access to alternative forms of credit as well who are gonna have the, the most access to credit lines of the most capacity. So here are the three columns, whether a firm has a credit line, uh, what their capacity is and this credit intensity. And here I'm gonna focus mostly on these two columns where you can see that basically um, uh, the more profitable you are, the more likely you are to have a credit line and to have unused, uh, the more unused capacity you have. Uh, the bigger you are, the same thing. Um, the more levered you are actually, the less likely you are to uh, have a credit line and, and the less um, capacity you have, that's not surprising. And also, um, in addition, firms um, that have more capacity have these characteristics, I guess, including the low leverage, that we associate with having better access to alternative forms of credit and being less constrained, such as uh, being investment grade, being public firm, uh, and, and being older. And these are items that, you know, Paolo Sirico and others have shown uh, are pretty well associated with firms being less constrained and less responsive to shocks. So our takeaway here is that we should probably think of these firms with credit lines as being dominated, credit lines are being dominated by firms that are among the least constrained in the economy. So those are, that's our summary of the levels. Now we're gonna get into uh, the dynamics and look at the role of credit lines in transmitting various shocks. We're gonna start at the idiosyncratic level. Um, so what we're gonna do here is just take a very simple measure. We're gonna look at just the change in total bank credit to a firm quarterly. And we're gonna decompose the variance of that change in credit into three terms. The variance on their term loan borrowing, 
the variance on the change in their credit line borrowing, and then a covariance term that's tiny, so we basically just ignore it. So um, what do we find? Basically, what we're going to show you here is the, the components, these two variance components, which add up close to one. And what you can see is for all firms except the very smallest firms in the economy, most of the variation in their quarter to quarter bank credit usage is coming from changes in the balances on their credit lines rather than their term loans. And this is especially true for the largest firms in the economy. Now we can look a little bit more structurally and look at how firms respond to a change in their cash flows. So now we're going to um, do, do a regression for firm I and industry K and location M at time T and horizon H because we're going to look at over multiple horizons. On the left hand side, we're going to take some measure of some type of credit L and measure essentially the growth rate. I'll talk a little bit more about this timing in a second. Uh, we're using this denominator, which actually instead of using the or start base value, we're going to use the average of the base value and the final value. That's like a centered growth rate. Uh, and if you ever worked with data like this, this is a great thing um, for dealing with outliers and things like this, or also dealing with um, initial values of L that are close to zero. Uh, which can be a huge problem, but with a measure like this, they're bounded between minus one and one. So it's much less of a big problem. On the right side, we're going to have um, firm industry time and location fixed effects. And then our coefficient of interest is going to be against the chain, the four quarter change in cash flows relative to initial assets. Um, we're going to have a vector of controls. And then this funny timing with this minus four is because actually, um, our credit information is updated quarterly, but most of our um, firm information on things like cash flows and assets is updated annually. So what we're going to do is we're going to start from the beginning of the four quarter reporting period and then actually look at the first couple of quarters are within a uh, uh, four quarter period where we know that that eventually the cash flow moves. So these are kind of as the cash flow changes building up. If that doesn't make sense, don't worry too much about it. Basically, you can just think of this like a local projection. And by the way, I'm going to actually flip the sign of this coefficient uh, because we're going to be talking about negative shocks mostly in the paper. So I want to keep everything uh, uh, on the same on the same sign. So this is actually a response to a fall in cash flows of um, of one percent relative to to assets. So what we can see here is that following the decline in cash flows, we see a, a large and significant in increase in firm credit use. So they're actually using credit to smooth over this shock. But I think what's really going to be more novel here is the decomposition, where we can break this decline in cash flows into a small and insignificant rise in term loans and a large and significant rise uh, in credit lines that really actually drives quantitatively basically the entire response of, of total credit. Okay, so if you want to know why is, you know, what are firms using to smooth over after um, uh, negative changes in their cash flows, which, by the way, of course, are not identified, we're just identifying patterns of, of what they seem to use, not not what causally uh, caused those shocks. Uh, regardless, I think it's still interesting that they mostly seem to be using credit lines. So now uh, one other piece of information that I think is pretty cool is that we can actually go one step further and ask, well, okay, we know the credit lines changed, but what changed about them? Was it that the firm went to the bank and got more credit line commitments and then kind of kept the same utilization rate? Or did they take the same credit lines and just draw on them more? And basically, it's the latter. So they, it's, not, it's nothing about um, them getting more committed credit lines. So if, it was a, if the utilization rate was constant, to explain this picture with commitments, it would actually have to track exactly the same way, which is why we plotted it on the same axis. But instead, it's a basically a pretty precise zero. Instead, what's going on is if we rerun the regression with the utilization rate, meaning use over committed credit on the left-hand side, what we find is that basically they're just utilizing their credit line more, a lot more during these, uh, after these negative cash flow changes. So if you want to know what's going on with firms, it's not only the credit line, it's the credit line utilization of existing lines that's really driving this pattern. So now we're going to kind of redo the same exercise, but looking at macro shocks. So to start, we're going to look at the response to a monetary policy shock at the aggregate level. And so basically, um, because it's an aggregate shock that doesn't really vary by firm, uh, we're going to kind of put it, just aggregate up over the whole economy uh, into these L's. So these won't be firm level anymore. If you want to see the firm level, we have it in the paper. Um, but what's going to be interesting that's new is we're going to be able to decompose this into the different instruments, credit lines and term loans. 
So what we're going to do is, is use monetary policy shocks. So we're going to identify these uh, as the, the change in the two-year treasury note around a 30 minute, uh, in a 30 minute window around policy announcements. Uh, we could use Nakamura science and identification, you, you get the same thing. Um, and by the way, just to be clear, one big difference between this and the results I showed you before is that we have a totally different uh, time sample as well as the shock identification. So they're not going to line up exactly, although we're going to get the same pattern. So what do we find? So again, as I showed you in the introduction, all credit is actually rising following a monetary policy shock. Um, but again, this is broken up into two pieces. We have a term loan piece that's in this case, not only not positive, it's negative, uh, although it's insignificant. And then on top of that, we have a credit line piece that's actually driving, uh, that's both highly significant and driving basically the entire response. If we were to dig further, which um, we do in the paper, what you find is that this response is actually dominated by large firms in the economy with a lot of pre-existing capacity. Um, and so the takeaway is that, you know, when we're thinking about transmission of monetary policy through bank lending, which is an important part of, of macro and corporate finance, uh, we think we should really take the credit line part of this very seriously, because that's the instrument that's really doing all of the work uh, in terms of the response to, the, to these shocks. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, credit movements around the COVID-19 outbreak. And this is, this is pretty uh, uh, amazing, I think. I was very surprised when I saw this. So what we did is we decomposed the credit growth um, by firm and loan types. So remember, we already showed you an aggregate. Credit's rising around this episode. We're gonna break it down. What we're gonna do is measure growth uh, for a specific, um, firm and loan type between 2020 Q1 and 2019 Q4 and divide that just by total used credit in 2019 Q4. And what that means, by the way, just to be clear, is we're going to have the blue bars for all firms. We're going to do all credit and then break it down by types of credit. And then we're also going to break it down by the top 10% of, of firms by assets and the bottom 90% by, by, by assets or by, by size, basically. And the one thing I want you to know for reading the chart is this is not proportional to credit for that firm. This is proportional to total credit. So the yellow and orange bars add up to blue and all these blue bars add up to the, the blue for all credit. Okay, so we're really breaking it down like a decomposition. So what do we see? First, um, what we can see basically is that um, all credit is increasing uh, basically because existing draws on existing credit, like the, sorry, the balances on existing credit facilities are increasing. And because it's implausible that firms are increasing the balances on term loans, this is basically all coming from uh, the balances on existing credit line facilities, okay? Uh, very little is coming from the opening of new credit lines. Very little is coming from uh, new term loans being issued. And you can also see that there's an interesting distributional pattern where um, the, the vast, vast majority of this large rise in credit is actually accruing to the top 10% of firms, okay? Um, now, of course, you might say, well, they're the biggest firms, of course they get the most credit. But remember, what I showed you before is that this is just for bank credit. And actually this top 10%, they only have 40 to 50% of used bank credit. So this even compared to um, the distribution that we see in levels in the existing data, this is much, much, much more skewed toward large firms than the, than the overall unconditional distribution of bank credit. Now we can break it down and see that actually even beyond, um, unsurprisingly, even beyond this point, it's really uh, the draws on existing credit lines by the largest firms that are driving the vast, vast majority of this change in used credit. And you can see in the right panel that basically uh, nothing is going on with changes in committed credit. So that could occur either because firms are taking on new term loans or renegotiating their credit lines to make them more uh, larger None of that is happening uh, at any level. So basically all of this action here is just coming from the same credit lines that existed before being drawn on more, okay? So here's something that's actually not in the paper yet. It's brand new. I'll show you what happens if we look at the Q2 data. And this is actually really interesting. So previously, right, if you go back here, you'll see the bottom 90% of firms, they're not doing great, but they're at least getting some additional credit, okay? If you look at the Q2 data, what we find is that actually not only are they not getting credit, they're actually losing credit. 
um, they're actually losing out. And uh, part of this may be because, uh, as is pointed out by uh, a new forthcoming paper by uh, Chodo Reich and co-authors, um, these smallest firms also have the shortest maturity credit lines, which could, means that actually things could get even worse for them as time goes by, because even the credit lines they have may expire and may not be able to um, be renewed at the same terms. So actually things may even, this may, things may get even worse and even more unequal in terms of that, that measure as time goes forward. Okay, um, great. So let's, um, let's move on to credit supply. So that's kind of about credit demand, right? Who's drawing credit, who's getting it? Uh, but an important question is, what happens to the banks when they're getting these credit lines drawn? And in particular, we're interested in an important spillover, which is did banks experiencing drawdowns on their lines reduce their term lendings? And remember, because the access to credit lines is very unequal, the incidence of this uh, retraction in term lending credit supply would also be very unequal, okay? Now the challenge is a typical one. We need to isolate the effects of credit supply uh, from anything that's just a, a correlation between how firms select the banks uh, and how those firm demand for credit is changing in the COVID period, uh, you know, uh, for, for the reasons that we all know. So what we're going to do is the standard approach. We're going to follow Kwaja and Mian in using firm fixed effects to control for firm demand. Okay. What does this look like in a regression? For firm I, bank J, and loan type K, we're going to run, uh, it's going to have T's on it, but we're just running it for one particular quarter, 2020 Q1, the regression of the growth in firm credit from bank J um, of type K, again, using this kind of centered growth rate uh, on a firm fixed effect, plus a bank level variable, that's how much change the bank experienced on the balances of their existing credit lines, meaning how much did their credit lines get drawn down at the bank level divided by the assets of that bank. So this is kind of a measure of how much the bank was affected by drawdowns. We have some other bank controls and that's it. Okay, so as usual, the identification here comes from firms with multiple bank relations. And we're gonna further restrict the sample to firms with uh, term loans only because that's, we wanna avoid anything about firms substituting away from term loans into credit lines, but keeping their credit constant. These are going to be firms that are really more reliant on term loans. What we find is that drawdowns equal to 1% of bank assets are going to lead to between a 1.2 and 1.4% decrease in new term lending. Now the denominators are different. So it's not like they, they get drawn a dollar and cut lending by 120. Um, term loans are a little bit less than half of bank lending. So it, you can cut these numbers roughly in two. But still, what we see is actually a large and significant decline of term lending in response to larger drawdowns on credit lines, okay? Um, these results are actually stronger for fixed rate term loans. Why are we interested in those? Those are the type of loans typically used by the smallest firms in our sample. Um, and these drawdowns are actually also um, not really offset by deposit inflows, which actually surprised us. So it turns out that, you know, deposits are also going way up during this period. And there's been a, some nice work showing that actually banks can try to match their credit line drawdown exposure with their deposit inflow exposure. But interestingly, uh, if it was just about whether banks could fund the new lending, you'd expect these coefficients to have opposite signs. So if they get a dollar of deposits and a dollar of drawdowns, they just send the dollar of deposits to the firm that's drawing down and do the rest of their lending as, as usual but they're not. Instead, deposits seem to have no effect on how much the drawdowns influence the bank's term lending. So we think that this implies that whatever's going on, it's not something about direct ability to just have the, the money to finance a loan. Maybe it's something more about uh, regulation, market forces, things like this that make these drawdowns have a big effect on lending. And finally, uh, if we remove the firm by loan type, uh, you know, the Kwaja Mian fixed effects, we gain a lot of firms in the economy. We, we of course lose some of this nice identification. We can look at a broader sample of firms and we find the results are attenuated a bit, but still very robust to, to, to this uh, approach. We could also, by the way, if you're worried about any correlation between firms like let's say drawing their lines because they perceive the lender as unhealthy, we can actually instrument for drawdowns um, by, just by firms pre-existing unused credit line capacity and you get very similar results. So it's not something about just how firms are reacting to the, the, the bank health after COVID-19. So our takeaway here is that uh, credit line draws by large profitable firms 
do appear to crowd out credit to smaller and more constrained firms in the economy. Okay, so now I'll show you the structural model. Um, and what's gonna be our goal, right? So we wanna capture, um, uh, you know, I'm a little bit, yeah, I think I'm good on time. Uh, so what we wanna do, again, is this is all about the distributional implications, right? A key part of what I've been telling you about credit lines is that they, their access is quite different for different types of firms. So what we're gonna start with is these two types. We're gonna have constrained firms that are gonna be facing a binding minimum on their dividend payouts. Okay, so they, they can't pay out less even if they want to, while unconstrained firms are gonna be interior on their dividend payouts. Okay, they actually face the same constraint, it's just not binding for them because they have grown out of it. Now we also want a reason why uh, firms are gonna use debt, like why does debt matter? We have to break Modigliani Miller, we're gonna do this with a tax shield. So the firms prefer to finance with debt if they can. Next, we're gonna introduce credit lines, the key instrument in our model. And matching our empirical findings, we're gonna have these held by the unconstrained firms only. What's a credit line? It's just debt that's pledged at a fixed spread. Whereas the constrained firms who borrow in the, in, with term loans, they have to borrow at whatever the current market spread is. Okay, and just so you have in the back of your mind, at the end of the day, this model is, oh, oh sorry, uh, I have to tell you about the debt limits. The debt limits are gonna be um, in the form of debt to EBITDA covenants um, that I think are very realistic. They kind of follow the form in another paper of mine that I'll talk about more later. And what you should have in the back of your mind is that this, this mechanism is all about firms sort of um, choosing between using their different margins and allocating adjustments according to these different margins. So basically after a negative shock, Firms have to make some adjustment and they're gonna balance that adjustment between cutting their dividends, which they can do, but is subject to preferences for smooth payouts. Uh, these could stand in for other financial frictions that you think are going on. Um, they could cut their investment, but of course, because of adjustment costs, that, that has its own frictions as well. And finally, they could borrow, but of course, borrowing more is gonna uh, add additional covenant violation risk. So let's look at the details. We're gonna have three types of household. Uh, unconstrained entrepreneurs, we're gonna own the unconstrained firms. Constrained entrepreneurs who own the constrained firms and savers, okay? We have these types just to create, um, we give them some concave utility. And that just means that when they tell the firm what to do, they're gonna have in mind that they prefer a smooth consumption stream, which means that the firm should, should produce a smooth dividend stream. That's how we, we put an incentive into to smooth dividends. The savers, we're gonna make them risk neutral actually, because we're gonna have another mechanism for generating spreads that I'll show you. Uh, we thought it'd be cleaner just to keep them separate. And then they have disutility of labor and then uh, everything else about the preferences is standard, okay? Where their labor is gonna aggregate over labor provided to the two sectors. Um, we're also gonna have perfect risk sharing within each type, which is gonna make our lives very easy because we can aggregate each type into a representative agent. The production function will be basically standard. It's gonna be Cobb Douglas. We're also gonna have these uh, IID idiosyncratic shocks to capital quality, uh, just like in Bernanke, Gertler, Gilchrist and other work of that nature. Um, these are only gonna have the role that they influence firms covenant violation risk, which I'll show you in a minute. Productivity, which is gonna be the only shock we consider, it's gonna be an error one in logs. And uh, just so you know, when I talk about EBITDA, what I mean by that is um, the value of the firm's output net of the wage bill, which is uh, gonna turn out to be proportional to, to capital. And we're going to guess and verify a symmetric solution uh, for all firms of type J. For every control variable except labor, labor uh, is going to vary because it's going to react to this omega shock. Okay, so a firm, uh, here's how the debt covenants work. A firm is going to violate its covenant if its start of period debt, L, just deflated from the previous period, exceeds a threshold L bar. Okay. So what is L bar? L bar is gonna be inspired by a debt to EBITDA covenant, which is the, the most popular and most uh, relevant covenant over this period. If you have seen my other work, interest coverage covenants are also very important, but because interest rates were so low over this period, it's really the debt to EBITDA that's gonna be binding for the firms over this period. So what we're gonna do is limit debt to some multiple of smooth EBITDA uh, times a shock, right? And basically um, that's the only place where the shock is gonna come in. Um, what this means is that uh, your L bar is gonna be some parameter theta, that's like the term in your contract, times your shock, times the average um, smooth EBITDA for all firms in the economy. And that's how we're gonna do this. So there's an aggregate piece common to all firms plus the idiosyncratic piece for you. That's gonna make you concerned about violating your covenant in a way that you can't control. 
What is smoothie beta? Uh, that's just basically um, uh, infinite order uh, AR1 over your past EBITDA. We could do it with the last four quarters, but this is just a little cleaner. Um, and what this means is that uh, if you combine these two, this expression, just rearrange it, you violate whenever your omega shock is sufficiently bad. And that threshold depends on how much debt you bring in as well as your EBITDA, okay? If you violate, you pay a cost that's proportional to the total balance on your debt. So why am I doing all this? Basically, uh, I want two things. Um, first, firms are gonna face as a result of this convex cost of leverage, but they're not literally credit constrained. So at equilibrium, firms are gonna realize they could get these bad omega shocks and they're actually not gonna go all the way up to the limit. They're gonna give themselves some room so they could get some fraction of bad omega shocks and not violate and pay the cost. So you have a precautionary buffer. What that means is that the firms can borrow a dollar if they want to. They just don't want to because uh, of the risk it would involve with violation. Why is this important? Well, we saw the credit rises following adverse shocks, okay? And typically models have that the credit limit, whatever you specify as L bar, that usually is gonna shrink in bad times. So what we need is a model where actually firms, even though they recognize that L bar has decreased, they can choose, even though it's costly, they can choose if they really need credit to go get more. And that's really key to our result that credit rises, right? You really can't get this with, with another model. And second, why do we use covenants specifically? You could actually get this kind of similar continuous uh, thing where, where firms have some room to borrow from a, a financial accelerator model. What's really important is that covenants can constrain credit lines even when the spread on a credit line is fixed. So a typical model like the financial accelerator would say that you stop borrowing because your spreads are rising but the spreads on credit lines don't rise the more you borrow. I mean, you could pay some fees, but that's not really a, the most important part. So instead, kind of as Sufi has argued in his work, what really prevents you from drawing your entire credit line is you're worried about violating your covenant. And that's gonna work in this case, even though the spread is fixed. So the firm's problem is standard. Uh, they value uh, the present value future dividends using the entrepreneur's SDF. The budget constraint, what do they have for dividends? They have all the return on capital net of their payments on the debt, including the uh, violation, expected violation cost here. They have to buy new capital, but then they can also get new debt. So what are the, the last pieces? We have these payout constraints, uh, and these are gonna be just like in Bernanke, Gertler, Gilchrist. So a fraction of one minus gamma of firms are gonna exit each period. Why is exit important? Well, when you have a minimum on your um, dividends, so we're gonna constrain dividends to be non-negative, it means that if you exit fast enough, you never grow out of this constraint, basically. Now, if you combine this uh, constraint that dividends can't be negative with our budget constraint before that, that says what dividends are, basically, you get this expression, which says that your total investment in new capital is equal to some fraction gamma. It's essentially the resources of the surviving firms plus whatever they can borrow. So this means if your constraint binds here, every dollar that you borrow goes directly into investments. So these firms basically have an MPI, marginal price to invest, of one out of credit, okay? and firms use credit exclusively to invest. When this constraint is slack, firms can also use credit to either increase or smooth their dividends. And that's gonna be kind of the, a key to our results in the model. And we're gonna calibrate these exit rates so that unsurprisingly, the constrained firms don't grow out of the constraint, it binds, and the unconstrained firms do grow out. So they're, they're actually interior on dividends. To close the model, the, the other main thing we need is some form of spillovers through spreads. So we're gonna say that savers actually have a convex cost of financing debt and as a result, the rate on a loan to sector J is gonna be equal to the risk-free rate plus a, a markup, right? And this markup is basically gonna be increasing in the total credit to both sectors in the economy, which means that basically as one sector is borrowing more, it actually increases the spreads on both sectors. We then have to do some standard stuff. We aggregate the final good. We have capital subject to some capital adjustment costs that are standard, and we're gonna just have constant inflation flex prices. Okay, the calibration, I'm just gonna skim over. Uh, you can see the paper. Uh, the most important thing is we actually have realistic calibration for the covenants. So we're gonna calibrate the covenant cost and the dispersion so that firms have a leverage of 30% each sector and they violate with probability one in four, which is pulled from this nice Chota, Reich, and Filato paper. That's the debt margin. In terms of the fraction of the other margin, we're gonna give uh, them a very weak smoothing motive. We're gonna have the investors have CRA utility with, uh, curvature 0.1. So it's like 10 times weaker smoothing motive than log utility. And then we're gonna have a pretty standard investment margin 
uh, just taken from the literature and a lender response elasticity that we think is pretty reasonable for this episode. I'm happy to talk about this more later. So now let's get into the experiment and the results. Motivated by COVID-19, we're going to compute the response to a, a negative TFP shock of a size 10% that reverts at persistence, uh, or that has persistence 0.75, which is basically the implied persistence from the survey professional forecasters output forecast. Um, for now, uh, to start, to build up, I'm going to first assume that all firms use term loans, and then I'll show you the credit lines in a second. And term loans just mean they borrow at the current market spread. I'll show you three economies. The term loans economy, in which this is the, the, what I've been describing with the unconstrained and constrained firms of kind of equal size. The unconstrained only, where all the firms are unconstrained, and constrained only, where all the firms are constrained. So what do we find? So first, the yellow uh, economy, which is unconstrained only, we find that following a negative shock, um, all of them kind of have a bad reaction to output because it's just their TFP goes down. But following this negative shock, the unconstrained firms cut their dividends by a lot. That's really their main margin of adjustment. And they're able to do this because they have this flexible dividend margin. They're interior on dividends. So in a bad time, they just cut their dividends severely. And that means they don't have to cut their investment that much. And they also don't have to borrow too much because borrowing is going to be done at higher spreads in this case and also have higher covenant risk. That's also costly for them. Constrained firms in green are the opposite. They can't cut their dividends because they're constrained. So instead, they have to cut their capital by much more. And to try not to cut capital too much, they actually take on debt, even more debt, even though spreads are going up. It's worth it because it's so costly to do this disinvestment. Unsurprisingly, the term loans economy in blue has intermediate responses between the two in aggregate. But the distributional effects are very interesting. So take a look here. The top row is the unconstrained firms, bottom row is the constrained firms. And what we find is that in the term loans economy, credit is actually flowing from the unconstrained to constrained firms. So compared to when they're alone, the unconstrained firms borrow much less. In fact, their credit falls following the shock. Whereas compared to when they're alone, the constrained firms borrow much more. And what's the idea here? Unconstrained firms have very elastic demand, right? Because they can change their dividends easily. So they're not willing to pay high spreads. They'd rather just cut their dividends than, than borrow at high spreads. Constrained firms can't do this. So they have very price inelastic demand. So as spreads are going up in bad times, the constrained firms keep borrowing and the unconstrained firms stop borrowing. Now that's kind of uh, one part of the result. But also, this has implications for investment because the constrained firms have higher marginal prices to invest. So because credit's flowing toward these firms with high MPI, what you find is that actually the drop in capital in the term loans economy with both firms is actually closer to with unconstrained only, oops, sorry, than with constrained only. So this actually has real effects as well. So now uh, let's take a look at what happens when we incorporate credit lines. And what credit lines mean in our world is that basically instead of having a time varying spread, uh, firms basically just face a constant flat spread, no matter what happens, which we think is reasonable in the short run. What you can see is that the flow of credit is reversed. So before we had credit flowing from unconstrained to constrained, which by the way is completely the opposite of the data, now we have with the credit lines, unconstrained firms are taking on tons and tons of debt and the constrained firms are taking on much less. Why is this? Well, the unconstrained firms are still very elastic to spreads, their demand. But now, because they have credit lines, they're not experiencing any rise in spreads. They're insulated from that because the spread they face is fixed. So they figure credit's available at the same price. I don't care about smoothing dividends that much, but I care about it more than zero. So I'm going to smooth dividends. They borrow much more, and they mostly use that money to finance much, much more payouts in the form of dividends. Um, whereas the, uh, the constrained firms are stuck cutting, uh, cutting investment even more. What happens in aggregate? Well, we have two forces, and then I'll wrap up. One is that actually you have an aggregate effect, which is that more credit gets issued overall. Why is that? Because the unconstrained firms are growing their credit a lot and the constrained firm demand is very inelastic. So they actually don't cut credit that much. And so the overall, you get more aggregate credit issued. All firms in this economy have a positive MPI out of credit. So that actually pushes up investment. We also have a distributional effect that credit is now flowing toward the firms with the lowest MPIs, which pushes down investment. In our baseline calibration, this actually slightly decreases the capital, uh, this slightly amplifies the capital drop in this economy. Um, this looks pretty small, but actually compared to what we think of as the unconstrained benchmark, which is where all the firms are unconstrained, I mean, capital is going to fall after a bad TFP shock either way, even if you have RBC. Compared to a model where all the firms are unconstrained, this actually worsens the drop by about 20%. Whereas if you counterfactually gave the credit lines only to the constrained firms, you would reduce this distortion by, by about 40%. 
So actually, this does seem to matter. And by the way, in general, right, we see that this responsive output is small. We kind of get that. That's because we don't have a lot of frictions that we think are important for output, like working capital constraints, things like this. You could easily imagine the constraint firm, instead of disinvesting more, facing these constraints would also have less working capital, be able to hire less labor, things like this. So that's kind of in progress. So I'll wrap up here. Uh, we use detailed bank firm data that revealed credit lines is really central to the credit channel. They make up an incredible amount of credit, both used and unused, and explain most of the variation in credit, as well as most of the response to macroeconomic sh uh, shocks that we look at. But they're overwhelmingly concentrated among the largest, most profitable firms, which means that draws on credit line can crowd out term lending that the smaller, more constrained firms need. Finally, the model shows that credit lines are really important to reproducing the empirical flow toward unconstrained firms in bad times, and that this distributional effect across MPIs can actually make investment worse after a bad shock, even though aggregate credit is higher. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much, Daniel, for a great presentation. I'm going to hand it back over to Tony. Okay. Let's do this again. And let me set my timer. And we're going. I like the data analysis part of the paper. I thought that was largely fine, although there was clearly a lot of questioning from the audience who knew a lot about the institutional details. I thought that this part of the paper was really interesting. There's too much causal language. There's actually a lot more causal language in the paper than there was in the presentation. The footnotes drove me crazy. It took me forever to read it. Please don't do that to me again. But I thought that it was basically really, really interesting. So I am going to limit most of my content comments to the model, which actually dovetails quite nicely with the presentation, which was mostly focused on the data. So my main comment is, does the model get at the essence, the difference between credit lines and term loans? And what's going on in their model is that the really the only difference, they're utterly the same except of the interest rate terms. And so I was thinking, do interest rate terms on credit lines and term loans matter that much? Is one more flexible than the other or not? And when I was thinking about that, I think the maturity and flexibility of these two instruments matter more. So credit lines are by nature very short term. On some level, they're renegotiated in a uh, discrete time model instantaneously, like just every period. Term loans are by nature longer term. And so let me talk about this difference between credit lines and term loans a little more. One thing I've noticed about the macro folks who think about debt is that they don't talk to the corporate finance folks who think about debt, but that the channel is actually open in the other direction. So let me talk about what some of the other folks in the literature, before I get to this question of term, lo term loans versus credit lines, let me talk about what other people have, thought, have done. There's this nice paper by Nikolov, Schmidt, and Steri last year. They think hard about the use of cash versus credit lines. Both of these are, are instruments that can be used to manage liquidity, but one is state contingent and the other isn't. And so I thought that would be interesting to look at least empirically at which of these firms have huge cash balances and does that have anything to say about their use of credit lines versus term loans in mediating these shocks. Then there's Grimmis, German and Schmidt, Schmidt which I mispronounced. Um, they explain how it's essential to have long-term debt for short-term shocks to matter. There's a really nice, it's done in a very different framework, but they, um, the next paper shows that debt overhang is actually, can actually be less important for short-term debt. And that would certainly be useful for explaining the investment results in the paper because these larger terms have more essentially short-term debt. And then it turns, I used to think it was hard, but my co-author Yu Fang Wu has demonstrated to me that it's actually not that intractable to have both short and long-term instruments in a structural model. It's just not that bad. It solves in seconds. So the next thing I wanted to ask, which I thought was a little odd, is why the covenant restrictions on loans? And so this is something that folks in structural corporate finance have not used as a debt restriction mechanism. And I was like, th I was thinking why? And then I remembered many years ago, maybe back in 2008 or nine, I was thinking, hmm, maybe I'll write a paper on covenants. And then I thought, no, 
I'll get destroyed in a seminar because people will say that they should arise endogenously. And then I just didn't feel like getting beaten up. And so I, I tossed that idea. So there, that's one issue. I think one thing that's, um, that's also something that's hard to get at in a structural model. I think something that's more important is that covenants directly and mechanically tie the amount of debt to TFP shocks, and you don't need that. You can have a flat debt covenant and you can still get a, a, uh, just a flat debt constraint and you still get interior solutions. There's this idea, I think it comes from the uh, German Quadrini papers where they artificially restricted uh, debt to be at the limit, that it has to be there, but it doesn't. So if you look at the corporate finance literature, we've shown that if you estimate the model parameters, you can still get these interior solutions without having a stochastic constraint. Would these quantitative effects be the same without this state-dependent collateral constraint? I think that might be interesting because that really is a mechanical mechanism in the model that ties debt to TFP. Another thing that between loans and lines, credit lines are heavily collateralized, terms loans less so. One thing that might be interesting to do is to endogenize the loan spread. Can I go over two minutes, please? Yep, okay. No problem. So, so here's my wish list. And since I'm a discussant, I can do this because I can just I can just imagine. If I were modeling the debt, I'd have credit lines be short-term and collateralized and term loans be long-term and not collateralized. And then I, I was thinking that you could get uh, interesting results with just one sector and heterogeneity with, between, within the sector. And then I decided that would be impossible. I would have the sectors differ in their degree of assets that could be used as collateral. And then the amount of credit lines would depend on that and not just be exogenously imposed. I still think there would be distributional effects between sectors, but the me mechanism would be flexibility instead of spreads. I'll come back to that. If I were modeling the aggregate mechanism, is the mechanism firm choice of debt or is it bank loan supply? I think something that we saw in the financial crisis of 2008 was that firms drew down their credit lines and banks balance sheets were a disaster. So to what extent is this about firms choosing the way in which they finance their investment program, or is it about banks being un unable to lend given balance sheet constraints? And perhaps it would be useful to have a better developed intermediation sector with some serious balance sheet constraints. And then if I were modeling the consumers, I'd just go simple. There you go. Just simple, you know, in, just make the fresh elasticity go away. Because I think if you're, I think most of the action is in other sectors. And the only thing you get out of the consumer sector is this spread. But it's not obvious to me that the spread is the main thing that ought to be in the model. So can you get the results without the spread? So this is a neat paper. I love to discuss papers like this because they are really good and they're not perfect and so you feel like you can add value. It's an interesting topic. The data are great. The basics of the model are the right way to go. I just think that the emphasis could be changed a little bit and I'm done. All right. Thank you very much, Tony, for a very nice discussion. Um, we're going to go into the Q&A session. Um, if you want to ask a question here, please uh, raise your, use the raise hand feature, and we'll also start with some questions of general interest from the chat. In particular, I want to start out with Sasha Indarte from Wharton. Um, Sasha, please go ahead. Hi, so um, my question was about uh, how these firms, uh, essentially there might be heterogeneity in how monetary policy is affecting them. So these firms that tend to have a, a lot of unused capacity, they're probably the firms uh, that, well, it looked like they, well, they're larger, um, they had less leverage, they're basically more financially sound, and those are the firms the least in, in need of access to liquidity. So uh, it'd be interesting to, to, to get your thoughts about what, you know, what this channel means for is monetary policy targeting the, the right agents in the economy. Um, yeah, so I think that's, that's kind of, um, you touched on, on a couple of things. So, so one of them, first of all, is that, which I think you're not necessarily saying, but I think is important to address is that it could be 
something about like a correlation, right? Like some, something with response to our shocks is just that large firms tend to react more and large firms say, well, we have credit lines, so why don't we use them? But that counterfactually, they would have used term loans anyway, if they, you know, even if credit lines didn't exist, they would have done the same thing basically, but just borrowed with term loans, just more convenient. Uh, I think that's where the model helps to show that a lot of these patterns are actually reversed if, if you use credit lines. So um, let, me, let me now get to your specific question. I think that's, that makes total sense to, to me. Um, basically, uh, um, you know, when you have a contractionary shock, I mean, it's a little bit hard to think about what the Fed is targeting. Because remember, when they're trying to do a, con a contractionary shock, I guess they're trying to cool down the economy. And what, what we're finding is that um, somehow the biggest firms are able to avoid it, the smallest by, by borrowing anyway, and the smallest firms are more affected by the, by the funding costs. So I don't know how that fits into what they're intending or not. But it certainly could easily have some distributional consequences of monetary policy, things like this, that, that would not be intended by policymakers. So it would be very interesting to look at, for example, how outcomes like investment and things like this uh, vary uh, along the firm distribution by, by these characteristics. I think other work has found that it is the smaller, more constrained, younger firms that, that do seem to be more effective. So maybe that's part of it. Great. Um, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, oh, yes, so please go ahead. Um, we do have some uh, results on that in the paper. I don't know if, if Dan uh, mentioned them because I was busy in answering the chat, but uh, we do find that um, the, the response to the monetary policy shocks is largely explained, uh, the aggregate response, by the very large firm with unused borrowing capacity. It's driving essentially all of the aggregate response. So we do have some results on that in the paper. I think it's a little bit more difficult for us to say whether those are also the firms in need or not, um, and so on. But that's a, that's a good point. Thanks, Sasha. OK. Uh, we'll move to our uh, next question, which is from uh, Sasha Steffens at, uh, or Stefan at Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. All right, go ahead, Sasha. You still muted? Hmm. All right, I think uh, we'll, uh, until we fix that uh, muting problem, I think we'll, uh, we'll move to the next one. If we could get uh, uh, Matthew Plosser from uh, New York Fed for a comment. Matthew, go ahead. Yeah, I, I mentioned this in the chat. Uh, obviously, we're, we're really focused on what's available in the Y14, but for the larger firms, um, a big dynamic for them in terms of borrowing uh, in this time period is the bond market. So I'm curious as to how you think about how the bond market influences these results. Um, obviously, speculation is welcome. So we actually have some results on this. Um, Pascal, do you want to do this one? Yeah. Um, so we do have some results in the paper um, about the response of uh, the bond market, uh, corporate bonds to monetary policy shocks. So even, even there, we see uh, a slight increase in corporate bonds to a contractionary shock. So that's somewhat in line with these uh, responses of bank firm credit that we have. Of course, as you say, um, we don't cover um, uh, most of corporate bonds. So um, that's not in the data and there's not much uh, we can do about it. Um, and, um, and of course, there, um, as there was some discussion in the chat about this, of course, there were some interesting dynamics in the bond market going on, which of course also affected the drawdowns. Um, but however, I think our results seem to be, um, in particular with respect to the credit supply effect that we estimate, they seem to be very persistent, not only uh, being present in Q1, but also being present in Q2. So there may have been policy interventions, there may have been a revival of the bond market, but these effects that we estimate seem to persist. Uh, yeah. let me can, 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 sorry, can, can I just follow up on that? that yeah. If you think it persists in Q2, is that consistent if we think the drawdown effect sort of attenuated in the Q2? Um, yeah, so here what we do is uh, regress basically uh, the term uh, credit, uh, term lending supply effect, we have that on the left hand side basically um, on, the, on the drawdown in Q1. So if you had a, if you had a higher drawdown in Q1, that seems to persist in, in the supply effect in Q2. So if that was completely reversed and it would basically um, undo the supply effect, then we should not find anything in Q2. But that's not the, that's not the case. In fact, it intensifies in Q2. So, so let, let me just add quickly, big picture, that kind of regardless of what the biggest firms are doing, what is pretty clear is that they're taking an unusually 
heavy role in the bank credit market during this time. So whether or not they're kind of substituting credit to and away from other forms, the smaller firms who are bank dependent are gonna be very affected by this, as long as banks are, are, are experiencing some crowding out effects with the drawdowns. Yeah, can I, can I just, uh, just add to that point that with the, uh, uh, with, with the large firms in our sample, they, they tend to have better credit ratings uh, in general and have better access to the bond market. So, so in, in, in that sense, the firms that were taking down the majority of the, of the, the bank credit, and so this is really thinking about Q1, uh, they, they, they were also the ones who, who had the best access to, uh, uh, to the bond market. All right, great. Um, let's go to our uh, next question, which is from uh, Killian Huber at uh, Chicago. Hi, thanks very much. So this is a very interesting paper and thanks for inviting my question. I wonder whether small businesses demanded credit from banks that offered few credit lines, especially during the COVID crisis. So we know that in bad times, firms tend to borrow from sort of safe harbor banks, often their relationship banks. And it seems likely that these type of safe harbor banks are less likely to, in general, offer credit lines. And therefore, um, there might be a firm credit demand that's bank specific. In that case, the Kwaja Mian fixed effect wouldn't quite take care of firm credit demand. I mean, more generally, I think my question relates to why these banks seem to be so constrained. So is the drawdown in credit lines really such a shock to certain banks that they can't lend anymore or is there maybe something going on on the firm side as well that explains the differential lending outcomes uh, depending on credit lines yeah a lot of government policy and so on might have alleviated some bank constraints so i think looking both at the specific specification of whether the fixed effect does the trick but also more generally accounting for what's really going on in these banks might be interesting so let me let me take a, a big picture answer and then and then turn over for some details to pascal and john um so this links back to something that Tony said. And by the way, thank you, Tony, for a fantastic set of comments. I, I think they're, they're all very, uh, they're very well taken. Um, this links back to, to like what's going on with, with the banks, why are they constrained, and, and what would happen if we took a more serious crack at modeling uh, the banking sector and some balance sheet constraints. So one thing that could be going on, right? Because remember, we had that regression where the deposits don't seem to help. So it's not something about uh, that they literally can't come up with the money. And in fact, the inflow in deposits over this period is larger than the outflow of credit line drawdowns. So it's not a strict financing constraint. Um, what could be going on, for example, one thing about regulation, for example, is that credit lines, while they're undrawn, do not have the full risk rate of a loan. In particular, credit lines with maturity less than one year have risk rate zero. So one thing that could be happening is that as firms are drawing the lines, actually, the, um, the banks are getting closer to their regulatory limits in a way that would not be offset by deposits. You can't just have more loans, more deposits and meet your capital requirement. Um, that could be one thing going on. We need to do more work to, to see how relevant that is. Um, the other thing that would be interesting about banks is that they're also these credit lines exposed turn out to be below market rate. So one thing that could be happening is that banks could also be taking equity losses because investors or they realize that now they're on the hook for all these commitments that are at old spreads, where the, whereas the new spreads are really high. And then for, for data details about the, the relationships, I, I don't know that correlation offhand. Uh, Pascal and John, feel free to chime in if you want. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Kiri. I know that's a, that's a very good point. Um, so it would basically have to be that um, firms have multiple relationships, and then within the COVID episodes, they, they go more towards the banks uh, with uh, that don't offer uh, so much credit lines, so the credit demand changes in that episode. So I think there, there could be a story that explains it, as, as you say. I think we do a couple of things in our respect to address that. One is we, we control uh, for various bank characteristics, so in, in particular size, which is something that would address your point. Um, so if that uh, that might capture capture such effects, we also do an IV regression in the paper where we have the level of unused commitments over asset as an, as an instrument for the drawdowns. So that may partly also address, I think, that point. Um, but I think it's a, it's a great suggestion. We could think of other controls to make capture that kind of story that you have in mind. Great, all right, we are closing in on the end, but I realized I forgot, Daniel, to let you respond to Tony. So if you, if you want to respond a little bit, then- Sure, uh, please go uh, ahead. Yeah. you know, it was really a great set of comments. I just have a couple, a couple thoughts. So Tony was talking about credit line maturity. One interesting thing that you can see in the Y14 data that's been more emphasized by a complimentary paper by Chodor Reichen co-authors uh, 
is that actually the bigger the firm, the longer the credit line maturity. So the smallest firms tend to have maturities of less than one year, the vast majority. The biggest firms have the vast majority of their lines with maturity more than one year, or the, the money is due in more than one year. So for those firms, maybe it's a little bit more appropriate. With the covenants- oh, can, I, can I interrupt? What I meant by maturity is you have this flexibility to repay at any time. Mm -hmm. So it, it resets at the will of the firm. That's what I meant by that. Okay, okay so but, maybe but, I misunderstood. But, but yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was a miscommunication, but keep going. And then uh, the only other thing I'll say is like, why did we put in these covenants? And actually the key is not that they, they move with EBITDA, which is, that's just the way that we usually see them in the data. So that's what we did. But the real reason is the following. In order to, to, to map what we, the model what we have going on, we need two things. First, we can't have firms at binding debt limits because those debt limits are gonna be fixed or shrinking, but their credit is growing. So we need to have a, some model where they have room to expand credit if they want to, even though it's costly. The second thing we need is we can't use a standard story where as you're becoming more and more levered, the bank is putting more and more spread on your loan. And that eventually dissuades you from borrowing. Why is that? It works great for term loans. It gives you big headaches with credit lines because the spread is fixed. So we just need some mechanism that gives you costly but not binding uh, increases in debt that works even if your spread is fixed. And that's the reason why we went the covenants route. There's no other uh, particular reason why I have that horse in the race. I think it's realistic, but, but that, that's my only other answer. Otherwise, the no. points are super well. Oh, yeah. No, I, I just, I've had great luck getting interior solutions with fixed co with fixed collateral that's all awesome i hope to chat about yeah, it more yeah, after. Yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 no and, and no and the rest makes perfect sense to me but you can get interior solutions in more than one way you don't okay. need to have the stochastic constraint so that perfect. will certainly do it yeah perfect yeah. yeah so i'm sure there's more than one way to do it and uh that's one yeah yeah but, all right but thank you so much yeah Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, Daniel, Pascal, and John, and thank you, Tony, for uh, being our moderator and discussant. Uh, next week, we are going to have our last uh, seminar in our summer series, which is uh, Yuran Ma from Chicago, uh, and the moderator is going to be Andrea Eisfeld from UCLA. So until then, I hope you guys have a great weekend, and we'll see you next Friday. Bye-bye.